from Schwartz Media, I'm Ruby Jones. This is 7am. The Albanese government has been accused of pork barrelling. After an analysis of $1.35 billion in grants, found almost 90% of projects were in Labor electorates. Labor has defended the grants, saying they were campaign commitments that had to be met. Today, Independent MP Helen Haynes on pork barrelling by the major parties and how, as we head to another election, the Albanese government rates on accountability and integrity. It's Wednesday, November 13. Good morning, Helen. Thank you so much for coming on 7am. Uh, hi, Ruby. Great to be with you. So you've done some analysis looking into the way the Infrastructure Department has spent some grant funds since the last election. To begin with, could you tell me a bit about why this is something that you wanted to look into, where it began for you? Yeah. When I was elected to Parliament in 2019, uh, a large part of my platform was around improving transparency and accountability in government, improving integrity and really sticking up for rural and regional Australia. So for me, uh, I'm always very conscious about where taxpayer dollars is being spent. And uh, of course, during the previous parliament, we saw some significant pork barrelling that was identified, car park rorts, sports rorts and the like. The Morrison government has been accused of pork barrelling on a grand scale after it was revealed almost $2 billion in taxpayer-funded grants was pushed into coalition electorates. Cabinet Minister Bridget McKenzie approved a $36,000 taxpayer-funded grant for a clay target shooting club in regional Victoria without publicly disclosing she was a member. It stinks more than a bucket of prawn heads that you left out on a hot day like today. So being an independent, I am alive to this happening uh, irrespective of who's in government. So I had a look at what the Labor government uh, promised during the election campaign in 2022 and uh, followed the trail of where some of that uh, election promise money went. And so what did you discover? So I had a close look at two grant programs that went to sporting clubs, uh, various organisations to do things like uh, improve swimming pools, build grandstands at showgrounds, things like that. And these two programs are called the Investing in Our Communities Program and the second one is Priority Community Infrastructure Program. Now, the total amount of money that was in the budget for these programs amounts to $1.35 billion. That's a lot of money. And uh, these two programs are... closed, non-competitive, invitation only, and they were set up with the express purpose to deliver on promises made during an election campaign when Labor were in opposition. I found that almost 90% of seats that Labor won or held at the election received a grant through these two invitation only, non-competitive grant programs. Now, to me, that was a great big red flag around a pork barrel. Right. Okay. And so you took these concerns to the infrastructure minister, to Catherine King. Can you tell me about that? So I went to her and said, I have a real concern about these two programs. And uh, in contrast to the $1.35 billion for the non-competitive grants for these election promises, we, we had less money allocated across rural and regional Australia for competitive grant programs. I take the view that the New South Wales ICAC uh, made that when public funds and resources are targeted to electors for partisan purposes, um, that's pork barrelling. Right. And what did she say back to you about that? Well, uh, the Minister and I have a fundamental disagreement about this. I think all major party uh, senior people believe that it is absolutely reasonable and fine, and this is just the way business is done during election campaign, that oppositions and uh, governments go out and make promises. So the minister and I have a different view of this. Um, So 
that's how the meeting went. And I then let the minister know, given that there was no other explanation than that these were uh, promises made during the election campaign, that I would be referring these two programs to the Auditor General. Uh, it's ultimately up to the Auditor General to decide whether there is time in uh, their work schedule to take a look at this. Right. And this issue, the issue of how grant money is allocated and whether it's done so in a fair way, it's not new. So can you tell me about how you've witnessed this in your own electorate over the years as major parties have attempted to try and and win it back? When I ran in 2019, there was uh, prime ministerial visits, there were promises of all sorts of infrastructure. And one was uh, uh, on our major highway was to create an overpass uh, in a difficult intersection. The McCoy Street intersection has long been described as a death trap. 50 trucks a day go through the intersection. David Byrne has witnessed several near misses. Uh, There was significant federal funds promised by the then Morrison government and ultimately that project didn't continue during the subsequent government. I kept pushing for that money to be delivered, but it couldn't be delivered because uh, the planning wasn't done. There wasn't the matching funds from the state government and ultimately uh, when uh, the Albanese government formed in uh, 2022, That particular project uh, under Minister King's audit was found to not be able to be fulfilled. The notoriously dangerous intersection is one of 50 projects on the chopping block that cuts already slammed by truckies and politicians alike. And uh, there were many projects, not just in my electorate, but across Australia that fell into that category. So when projects are promised without complete and careful planning. They often are delayed or fall over or have insufficient funds. You know, ultimately, communities don't always win from this. In fact, um, you know, there are plenty of examples where where ultimately they, they lose from this. I, I think it's a really egregious practice and I don't think it should continue and I'll continue to call it out until such a time that we can stamp it out. But I I know that that's not a view held by the major parties, Ruby. That's a view held uh, by integrity experts, such as the Centre for Public Integrity, Accountability Roundtable, and indeed New South Wales ICAC. So that's where we are right now. And of course, we're coming into election season again. And you can be jolly sure that this will continue to happen. Coming up after the break, the Albanese government's looming integrity test. Don't miss the 2024 Russell Hobbs British Film Festival, screening from November 6 through to December 8 at Palace Cinemas. This year's festival boasts a selection of tender dramas, action-packed thrillers, comedy, documentaries and retrospectives, starring some of Britain's most well-known faces, including Saoirse Ronan, Andrew Garfield, Florence Pugh, Rafe Fiennes and Jude Law. Head over to britishfilmfestival.com.au to book your tickets now. Cheerio! Helen, integrity in government was a big issue in the last election. A lack of integrity was one of the reasons that the coalition ultimately lost power. So how do you think that this government, the Albanese government, is going to be judged on that metric as people come out to vote again? Well, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. You know, full points to to the Albanese government in the National Anti-Corruption Commission being created. However, I think that this government uh, gets less points from me. They have not fulfilled their promises uh, around robust whistleblower reform, and I have very deep concerns about that. Right now we have Mr Richard Boyle, who is, you know, a case exemplar of the failures and weaknesses of our uh, whistleblowing laws. Today, former public servant Richard Boyle will face court in South Australia accused of doing just that, blowing the whistle on dodgy tax practices at his former employer, the Australian Tax Office. He'll be represented in court by Kieran Pender. I think we've seen the impact of lobbyists and that's been playing out uh, through the, the various concerns around Qantas in the past few weeks in particular, where we have almost unfettered lobbying happening across the parliament. Uh, we don't know what happens behind ministerial doors when, when lobbyists are there. 
Uh, we don't have open and transparent ministerial diaries, for example. And I think perhaps the third element is also the Jobs for Mates work that Sophie Scomps, uh, member for Mapella, has been undertaking. We cannot be confident that appointments to statutory boards and the likes are completely merit-based and not influenced by political favours. And you mentioned the National Anti-Corruption Commission that the Albanese government has put in place. You campaigned for its creation for many years. So the knack that we now have, how does it compare to what you had hoped to see established? Well, Ruby, you're right. We finally achieved uh, passing that legislation, gosh, about 20 months ago now, And to Labor Party's credit, when they formed government under Mr Albanese, that was very high order of business. And I was very happy to engage fulsomely in that process. Uh, I wanted uh, some stronger transparency elements in that legislation than was ultimately achieved. But um, I certainly celebrated, as did many others, when we were able to stand up the very first uh, Federal Anti-Corruption Commission. So um, how's it gone since? The National Anti-Corruption Commission has ruled out further investigation into the public officials behind the disastrous robo-debt scheme that saw hundreds of thousands of Australian families hounded for debts they didn't owe. And there's no question the Australian public very, very disappointed about that and, and exercised their rights under the legislation to complain to the inspector of the NAC. Uh, In my mind, the strong legislative authorities of the inspector have played out in a way that is, I think, appropriate. The National Anti-Corruption Commission says it'll review its decision not to launch an investigation into the robo-debt scandal. A review of that decision has been released, claiming the watchdog's commissioner didn't properly deal with a perceived conflict of interest. There was a finding of misconduct, which subsequently has now led to an eminent person being appointed to reinvestigate whether robo-debt should be investigated by the NAC. Mm. I mean, everything that you've outlined, to what extent do you think that they point to some fundamental problems? Do you think that there needs to be some sort of overhaul, some sort of reform of the NAC at this point? I think what this points to is a rocky start to the NAC. I certainly wish that we hadn't had a, a finding of this type by the inspector uh, so early on in in the uh, standing up of the NAC, but uh, I feel confident that the role of the inspector, the way the legislation is working, uh, has demonstrated that the legislation is strong in that a, an inspector without fear or favour can come in and say, um, look, there's a problem here and it needs to be fixed, so I think that's good. I don't think the NAC needs an overhaul, not at all. I think we now need to let this process play out The uh, inspector's report has been tabled. There is an eminent person now delegated to re-look at the decision on robo-debt. And, in fact, we have a public hearing. uh, The Oversight Committee, of which I'm Deputy Chair, Ruby, we have a public hearing ourselves with the NAC on the 22nd of November and uh, we will be examining the first year and so there'll be opportunities to ask questions and I'll certainly be doing that. Alan, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure, Ruby. Thanks for the opportunity for a chat. In a statement to the Saturday paper, a spokesperson for Minister King said that all projects underwent a rigorous merit assessment to confirm eligibility under the program guidelines and to determine value for taxpayers' money. Any projects that did not satisfy these requirements were not approved for funding. Also in the news today, the federal government has earmarked up to $80 million for the regional airline Rex, which went into voluntary administration in July. The government says the funding will keep critical regional routes running, as well as pay entitlements for Rex's former employees. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office has confirmed the Prime Minister approved pager attacks against Hezbollah in Lebanon. In September, thousands of pages used by Hezbollah members simultaneously exploded in Beirut and other areas, killing at least 12 and injuring thousands more. I'm Ruby Jones. This is 7am. See you tomorrow.